The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello, Viewpoint listeners. This is based at Internet Television, national political correspondent Tony Mizuko, coming to you with episode 15 of Viewpoint. I am joined this evening by our producer and director of programming for Based at Internet Television, Ed Jupin. And we have a special guest this week. We have Larry the Lobster joining us. Larry the Lobster is a regular on As We See It, and he'll be joining us throughout the program this evening, and we'll be having his own special section of the election update to talk about Elizabeth Warren and her Cherokee heritage issue, or as Larry likes to call her, Dizzy Lizzie. Welcome, Larry the Lobster. Great to have you on board on Viewpoint this week. Well, glad to be here. We're going to we're gonna see how much Larry knows about politics, Tony. That's true. Usually he's yeah. pretty good on his general knowledge, but I don't know if he's a specialist too that uh, can compete on Viewpoint. Well, we're going to find gotta, out. Well, we'll find out. Yep, and i got to tell you, I hate to talk station business with our uh, listeners listening, but I've got to tell you, we need to set some ground rules in the studio about people not eating potato chips before they go on <laughs> to record an episode because I did it tonight and now my keyboard's all greasy and it was a big mistake. So that, that should probably be uh, in the rule book somewhere Well, that's else. okay. Speaking of as we see it, Fred does that all the time. So there you go. You're not alone. <laughs> the leadership from the top. But what can you do? So, folks, we're going to start off this evening with our In the News section and we're going to go right into a subject I'm going to call – war drums in Syria. There may have been a few news articles that picked this up, but it started to pick up more in the last couple of weeks, and there's a few things that precipitated it. Some of the smaller things, one of them that I think that didn't really get carried by the mainstream media and nobody made a big deal about, but there was a student network of some sort in Iran interviewing a Iranian general, and it seemed he made a slip up in reference that some elite Iranian forces were actually helping the Syrians with their crackdown in, uh, in Syria. And although that didn't really make it too much into the mainstream, I think that actually had a bigger impact than most people realize. Iran and Syria are very much interconnected. The Syrian regime, for all intents and purposes, is a proxy regime of Iran. Iran uses Syria through Hezbollah and some other groups to destabilize Israel and really destabilize the region. And they support them with money and financing and terror groups and all that. So it's no surprise that they would be helping them one way or another with their brutal crackdown. Of course, the more pressing call for this came as a result of a Syrian massacre of over 100 people in, I believe it was Homs, although I could be getting the city Where the number keeps wrong. going up, too. Every day you read the number going up. Right, and, and I'm sure whatever the final official number is, is far lower than what it really is. Oh, yeah. So Lindsey Graham has come out recently and said he supports a no-fly zone in Syria. Now, I'm going to explain what that is briefly. We, we, we did this in Libya, so to speak, and we did it in Iraq for, ooh, 98, no, 91, I mean, probably 10 the or 12 years. Yeah, the early 90s. A no-fly zone is not just a piece of legislation. A no-fly zone requires enforcement. Now, here's the interesting thing. At a very basic level, for any of the viewers out there who don't know, essentially the United States and our Western allies, et cetera, et cetera, would ensure that no enemy or no Syrian national uh, aircraft would be able to fly in the area and they'd be able to monitor or allied aircraft would be able to monitor and fly freely and all that jazz. Basically, taking out a country's air defenses and their air structure and whatnot, which really is a prelude to war because let's face it, it's a very casual and easy way to say we're going to take out your air force, we're going to take out your radars, your early warning systems, your transportation and your air transportation and all that. Because that's what we would do before we were to invade, whether or not we were supposed to. Now, it's interesting that he's proposing this in Syria. Because at this point, there has been little, if any, evidence that the Syrians are using their air force to attack rebels and even civilians. A lot of it appears to be going on on the ground. I didn't now, even know Syria had an air force. Well, I mean, what you would call an air force. I think, to be honest with you, Syria spends, last time I checked, uh, and this is going back several years, less than a billion dollars on their, their entire <laughs> defense budget for their whole country. One of, one of our planes costs more than e that. Exactly. Well, stealth bomber cost a billion dollars. So, I mean, a cruise missile alone is like 800 grand. But it's interesting, because in Iraq, it was that Saddam had used his air force against rebels. Uh, he had used his air force in many different ways. In Libya, it was the same thing. And again, I think it was sort of the prelude for the West to jump in, but the air force was going after civilians, and it was definitely an advantage that the Qaddafi regime had over these rebels and these insurgents. We haven't seen that yet in Syria. However, 
you enforce an no-fly zone. All of a sudden, you bomb some Syrian airfields. You take out their couple crappy little planes. I think somebody said that. They said, you know, after a day or two in Libya, the United States has decimated a Libyan air force. And I think Yeah, that, said, that was really said, difficult. Yeah, somebody said, you know, we took out the crappy Libyan air force. Did anyone think we couldn't? And, you know, with no casualties, might I add. But anyway, or at least on our side. So uh, the way this would work is, it, again, it's a prelude to war. It would give us an excuse to go in there, blow up what Syrian air ass assets there are, take out their radar, their early warning systems. And I tell you, there would be a lot of additional collateral damage that we'd be doing with the Syrian regime. We wouldn't go right after ground forces. But, you know, if you have a fuel storage depot that's an air force, you know, uh, an aerial fuel storage depot, and it has fuel for your, your ground vehicles or whatever, I mean, those things are going to get hit. It's going to begin destabilizing the regime. They're going to get worried, and it's going to create more instability that would hopefully help these rebels or these insurgents, whatever you want to call them. Now, this, the, excuse me a second, this no-fly zone thing, this happened, I don't even think this really went back to the Vietnam War. Is this something fairly recently, say, from the first Gulf War or so? I think because back in World War II, Korea, there was no such thing as no-fly yeah, th zone. This, was, this is what some might call soft power. It came about after the first World War, uh, excuse me, after the first Gulf War. Right. And the Gulf War, in some ways, put in people's minds, and people by this time had had this mind that, you know, war needs to be cleaner. It needs to be more casualty free. People have gone no say, going back damage. to the third, exactly little, very little collateral damage. People going back to the thirties had said that you know a war could be won entirely from the air, and we've nearly seen that happen. So it, it's one of those ideas. Again, they would say that it's just leveling the ground. You know what I mean? If people are really up, rising up against their government, it would be a fair fight or, or whatever. And that by denying an air force and by allowing the allies to fly in supplies or the West that you're sort of just leveling the playing field. But if you want my honest opinion, it's really just a prelude to war. It's a very nice-sounding, easy way. You know, Obama's done this, and Bush has done this, and the other Bush has done this. I mean, this is not a knock at one particular party or ideology, but it's a very nice, clean-sounding way to get in there and bomb the hell out of a country without any real reason to do it or without declaring war, without making it seem like a war. It's not a conflict. It's we're enforcing a no-fly zone. Now, I think in the case of Iraq, it was somewhat legitimate, but it became a joke, whereas, you know, every couple of weeks you'd read in the paper that U.S. or British warplanes were targeted by an Iraqi air defense system, and then they had to bomb them and take out the air defense system, and it just went on and on and on. And again, if you think about it, you're trying to convince people you want to go to war. Nobody's going to say we should go to war in Syria. But, oh, a no-fly zone, well, that, that sounds kind of lovely. That sounds nice and clean, and it, and it gets in our minds those nice, clear surgical strikes, and all we're doing is leveling the playing field. It's total bullshit. And let me tell you something. Lindsey Graham joining with his buddy John McCain, they're absolute warmongers. Whether you're coming from the right or whether you're coming from the left, you can't deny the fact that they're absolute friggin' warmongers. I mean, the situation that this country is in, and they're saying that we should go to war again, oh, but that's an issue for another time. This massacre was awful. It could reach a breaking point very quickly, very soon. And I know the United States and the West kicked out some Syrian diplomats. And they may have decided six months or a year ago to go to war with Syria, and they're just letting it build up. Also, going to war with Syria would destabilize Iran. There is a larger geopolitical context we've got to put these things in, whereas Syria is pretty much low casualty, low risk for the allies, could cause significant destabilization to Iran. There could be some benefits there. So that needs to be taken into account, too. Unfortunate result of it is, is that it looks like we may be heading towards a conflict in Syria. Their fellow Republicans have sort of said, eh, sh 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 let's not talk about this. The president has sort of said, ah, you know, let's not go there because nobody's really interested in war in Syria. But if massacres of this nature continue, I think the international community is, and to an unfortunate extent, does have a responsibility to act. I mean, this is not really a rebel insurgency. I mean, the Syrian government is brutally, brutally just shooting and cutting down their citizens. Now, who's going to go to bat for Syria on Syria's side if there's a conflict? Oh, Russia and China, of course. France to a lesser extent because they probably have some business interests in there. But what a lot of people don't realize is that Russia and China consistently oppose the United States, partially for economic reasons. But they also realize that the enemy of my uh, – well, I'm going to get that wrong – that you know, Syria is an enemy of the United States. They too consider themselves an enemy of the United States, whether we want to consider that the truth or not. So the more you have regimes like Syria, it's more of our time, our money, our resources getting deflected towards that. They also realize that if Syria falls, it'll put serious pressure on Iran. And if Iran falls, all of a sudden the United States has really very few negative, uh, very few enemies left in the Middle East. They don't want that because then we can move in, we can be more positive, oil concessions and all this other jazz. Oil, oil, oil. Absolutely, you know, and, and Russia especially who's hurting because oil prices are dropping 
and they're not able to sell as much because the economy around the world is really tanking, they're worried that a more stable Syria, a more stable Iran, i.e. a Western-leaning Iran, would open up production, there would be economic development, gas prices might come down, that would be good for them, that would be bad for Russia, though. Russia and Syria, however, excuse me, Russia and China, however, and they have opposed Syria, this, uh, any action in Syria quite, quite firmly. And part of the reason for that that people don't realize is there have been and continue to be huge protests in both Russia and China. You have two countries who Russia's economy is starting to, to dive, and they have a large population that is very unhappy. It's very unstable. It's a very volatile situation. It's not quite reported as much as it should be, but they're doing everything they can to repress their people. In China as well, the fact that there's any note of protest at all in China is big news, and the Chinese government is the most repressive regime, probably outside North Korea, on the face of the earth. And they're very afraid that these Arab Springs, so to speak, as, you, as we like to call them last year or a year and a half ago, that their people may start to do that. They might start to say, hey, these people took them out. The West came in. The West helped us. And even a big country like Russia or China, they're worried. They don't have to go. The United States doesn't have to go on to a, uh, a full-on war with either of them to just tip the balance in the favor of people protesting and people going there. I mean, a couple of well-placed cruise, muscle, well -placed cruise missiles when, you know, your people are protesting in 100 different cities, that's enough to destabilize the regime. And if the West Well, we start, certainly did it in Egypt. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, now we're not sure that was the right idea. So they're very worried and they're very afraid. But as this body count goes higher, as these gruesome images get out, and if this continues, which I think it will, they're going to be backed into a corner where internationally, if they start saying, well, we don't, you know, we still support Bashar, Bashar Assad, we still support doing, not intervening, they're not going to be able to take that position for very much longer. This is definitely a hit to their side of the argument. I think they're going to try to brush it off. They're going to try to play off the fact that the United States is really just not that interested in getting to a military conflict. But much more of this, and they're going to be forced to agree with the West and go along with the UN. Because the UN is also, ineffective as they are, starting to get very frustrated at the whole situation in Syria. And Kofi Annan, they've sent in there, and he's apparently not able to get anything done. Big surprise there. So they, they, their time is running out for them, and they've just got to hope that this situation stabilizes. And in a sense, up until this recent massacre, it had quieted down. There had been less media coverage. It almost, to be honest with you, seemed as if the Syrian government had just pretty much crushed the resistance. But with this recent massacre coming out, it's going to make it tougher and tougher for them in the future to continue to oppose any kind of intervention. Now, the impact this will have on the election if war breaks out, the short answer is nobody knows. The long answer is nobody knows. In unless, theory, unless your buddy McCain was going to run again and became yeah, president. Yeah, exactly. Tell me about it. I mean, in theory, if we're, we're taking Iran out of the equation for a second, a three or four month campaign that leads to something similar in Libya where Bashar Assad is deposed, the president might be able to play that off as a victory. And it might help in the campaign. He can say, you know, we've gone to war without these long term commitments like Iraq and Afghanistan. We've achieved the same results. We've deposed these dictators. And, you know, the world's a safer place. He could try to play it up as a foreign policy success if it works. Who knows what else could happen here? Uh, the only one that'll get credit for that is Hillary. Uh, you're probably right. But he could try. But again, the situation in Egypt is very tentative. We don't know who's going to come to power. The situation in Libya is deteriorating and it's fractioning, fractioning, if that's a word. I actually don't know if it is. It is now. It is now. We co copyright based on internet television. And there, there could possibly be a two or three state solution in Libya. And there could be more infighting, and we don't know whether the Islamists are going to take control in Libya or not. So he might be hesitant to want to call that a foreign policy victory. And depending on what happens in Syria, he may be hesitant to call that a foreign policy victory as well. It could be good for the region long term, but it could cause serious, serious short-term disruptions. Syria and Iran would be most likely to give Hezbollah a call and tell them to stir up as much trouble with Israel as they could. Israel ends up in some sort of a conflict situation if, I, if Egypt decides to attack Israel. And if Israel, I don't think, would lose a war per se, but if they lose significant territories, if Jerusalem gets invaded, all these different scenarios start to come into play. It destabilizes Iraq. It could be a very tenuous situation. I think the president is hesitant to move forward, not, not just because of the electoral concern, but we just don't know yet. And with the possible change in party in November, that could have a serious, uh, well, technically January, but that could have a serious impact. So I think the election impact, there's a chance it could be very positive for the president, but very many things have to go right in a very short period of time. I don't know how people are going to take with an ongoing conflict in Syria 
in the election. Mitt Romney would probably come out and say he supports it. I don't think he would take the opposing view, but I just don't know if the president wants to get into that. So he would be hesitant, in my opinion, if I were advising him. I mean, again, you got to do what's best for the security of the country and, and all that. But from a political standpoint, he's got to be very careful because similar to the discussions we've had on Iran, too many things have to go right in a row for this to be played off as a victory. And the country's tired of war. They're tired of conflict. We don't want to hear about it. It's the economy, stupid. So war drums in Syria, Lindsey Graham, the warmongering bastard himself with his buddy John McCain, and Joe Lieberman, who I do like, calling for a no-fly zone, prelude to war is what we need to look at that as. So hopefully that situation resolves itself. Next on our In the News section, is the zombie apocalypse here? I hate that term, the zombie apocalypse or zombie apocalypse. I hate this recent last five or seven years obsession with zombies and all this that's sort of taken pop culture by storm. Sure took over the movie industry. It, it, it sure did, yeah. And um, I guess the only reason I decided to include it is there was an article, as many of you know, a week or two ago about a man who was apparently drugged out on bath salts, which we're going to get to in a minute, and attacked a homeless man and started biting off his face. And ate his face off. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I, 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 for a split second, I said, is this the world ending? I mean, is this Night of the Living Dead really coming? I mean, what the heck? You never really thought it would actually be a friggin' zombie apocalypse. But for a brief moment, I was scared there. What this all comes down to, other than people just being batshit crazy, is these bath salts, which I don't know if you know about them, but they've been sold legally in many states. And of course, some of the southern states that have a higher level of poverty have had a bigger problem with them, but they're technically legal and they're supposed to be used in the bathtub to, you know, the same way you'd put Epsom salt on your feet or something. They create some nice smells and this and that. But people are, I believe, either snorting them or injecting them or smoking them. And they're creating a very powerful high, but with serious, serious psychological and other health impacts. I mean, Obviously, not, look at this guy. Right. And these are not substances that were designed to be drugs. I mean, they may have been, as some you know, chemist in a lab might have said, ha-ha, you know, this stuff secretly. Well, a different kind high. of drug, a relaxing drug. Like you said, it's a bath salt. Well, so it's, it's, it's a drug, but, a, you know, a different type of drug. Right. And I think it's just, you know, I remember years ago when I was a kid, the big scare was kids were getting high on aerosol cans and... Yeah with stuff like that. I mean, there's always something, but I think the United States... Oh, and glue. You know, when, when I was a kid, model airplanes and that kind of thing, model boat built, you know, ship building, all of that was still very popular. And you had the, like the plastic cement or the wood cement, you know, to build these models. Yep. And sometime when I was a teenager or maybe before a teenager, Larry, if you remember when this happened, chime in. You were no longer able to go into the store as a kid and buy that. They had it locked behind the counter or something, and a parent had to buy the model glue huh. because kids well, were uh, sniffing it. Yeah. Well, the same thing was done with um, spray paint. Yeah. Yeah, you're they right. They puff the spray paint. I, we shouldn't be discussing this, but I think they spray it into a sock or something and, and inhale it or something. I think I saw that on TV. I don't have personal knowledge of that. <laughs> anyway, the, these bath salts are – I think the government needs to move quicker – to do something about this because kids and younger people are always going to be looking for, and I know that sounds like generalization, people in general, that next new high, you're seeing a dangerous drug take a turn. These are not dangerous in the same way that heroin is dangerous because it leads to addiction and all this other stuff. And I'm not saying they're worse than that or less, but I mean, you're seeing these drugs and some of them, the uh, synthetic marijuana that's being found here and there, that within a couple of uses are having serious, serious, I wouldn't even call them side effects. I would call them life altering effects. There's been not much movement to get to, to get behind it, and I really think they do. I mean, come on. This stuff caused a man to gnaw another man's face off. This okay. isn't good stuff. Okay, and there's one other thing, which I don't know if you've heard about. New Jersey. It, no, it's actually – this is mostly with younger kids. Hey, leave say, New Jersey out of this. <laughs> this is mostly – it's mostly, it's mostly a problem with kids who are about five, six, or seven. They're eating the Tide Pods. Oh, yeah, I think I did hear about a that. What? No, I didn't know. What's that? What's a Tide Pod? Tide Pod. It's What's a, a Tide Pod? Oh, yes, it's okay. It's detergent in the little... Yeah, and actually package. now Procter & Gamble or one of those manufacturers, they even agreed to change the uh, packaging so that that can't happen anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's awful, but come on, parents. Pay attention to what your children are yeah, doing. Yeah, really. I mean, I don't know if I had the most attentive mother growing up, but I never put any... Uh, there's been so many crazy products over the years, even, you know, obviously in my lifetime. Those click-clack knocker ball things. Yeah. You know, that 
people used to get clobbered in the head by those. And then they said, of course, the things could shatter and then take an eye out. And, you know, a gazillion toys and different types of products over the years that we've mentioned it on this show in the past. And we've mentioned it as we see it. American society, all, all we believe in is suing here. And people in this country will just sue over the craziest little things. They will. I think one of the things that worries me about these bath salts, for instance, is I think they're coming from overseas. And there's different manufacturers, and they're not a – it's not like a company company out of Hoboken that makes them up. Yeah, and you don't have the uh, FDA and all that it, kind exactly, of Exactly. You know what I mean? They're getting made in China or India or some other you know, godforsaken place, and they're getting shipped over here, and they're you know, getting sold not in major retailers but in your little places Bodegas. here and there. And it, it's very tough to sit there and find someone and sue someone for them. And I mean, you can start telling stores not to sell them, but you tell stores not to let people use food stamps, you know, for alcohol and cigarettes, and that right. still happens. So, I mean, it's an enforcement issue. But yeah, and like you said, and who are you going to sue? Exactly. Who do you sue? Who do you sue in America? Who'd ever thought we'd be talking about not having somebody to sue? But anyway, it's a very disturbing news uh, article that came up in the last cycle. And, you know, there was an article from uh, just recently in New Jersey where a man had stabbed himself and actually started throwing pieces of his skin and intestine at the police. And they don't know if that's tied to bath salts, but they said it's clearly some sort of a drug-related issue. So maybe we're going to have to do a special section on drugs in America or a special show. But some disturbing, disturbing stuff. Usually you just hear a tragic story about some dumb kid getting high and losing his life because he, he overdosed or whatever. And I mean, I don't know, what would what would Joe Friday do here? Where Where is Jack Webb gone? Anyway, disturbing, disturbing news from around the country on the impact of drugs in the country. We're going to move on to our next in the news cycle, uh, in the news section story. Facebook falls flat. Now, to give a little preface to this. Ed loser I, stock. Me and Fred yep. have this thing. We call it a loser stock. Well, you know, it's interesting. For the viewers out there, Ed and I had a discussion last week uh, generally about the future of Facebook. And I said I think it's going to stick around. It, it's, you know, maybe not forever, but it is the new AOL in a sense that – or it was several years ago, the new AOL. It's a way people keep in touch online. You know, nobody really emails anymore unless you directly know people. Some people still go into chat rooms, but not really. I don't know if anyone actually uses AOL out there. I still laugh every now and then. I see an AOL email address, so I guess – some people must. So I think it'll stick around. Plus, it's also one of the first websites and the first social media sites that has brought a lot of different generations together. And, you know, you have young kids using it. You have your younger people, middle-aged people. You have seniors using it. So that's why I think it'll stick around. The stock is tanking, and I think it's going to tank further. Interestingly enough, to rate, relate this to politics, which is what Viewpoint is all about, the state of California expected to make a very pretty penny off this IPO, and they did not make nearly as much as they thought they would, and it doesn't look like they're going to be making many more residuals off it because California has awful state income taxes on uh, capital gains. But that's an episode, another an issue for another episode. So it's very interesting that California has taken a hit from this. But I think the reason is that Facebook, although popular and highly used, it's difficult to make money out of it. And here's why. Like most other sites... Yeah, what, do, what are you investing in? You know, I guess we should clarify that as we're recording this show on the, uh, what's today, the 29th of May, it's down to like 18 and change or 19 and change from its opening, or, or 28. 20, you know, it's, it's down... What eight eight dollars or something? Yeah, it's not coming back up either. Uh, from its IPO, and my point is, regardless of the numbers, you know, it's it's tanked significantly already in uh, less than a week. My point is, what are you investing in? You know, you give Mark Zuckerberg and company your hard-earned dollars, like like your point that you're trying to make. Just what are you investing in here? Even. BaseNet, and Tony will bring this up towards the end of the show, please invest in BaseNet if you're going to invest <laughs> in something. We're providing you quality audio programming, video programming. There's a tangible product, just like you pay your cable bill every month. BaseNet provides you with a tangible product. A social media site, to me, isn't that same kind of tangible product. What are you investing your hard-earned money in with this Facebook stock? Right. It's very popular now, and I think it will be in the future. The problem is you got to look at how does a site like Facebook make money? Now, they will never, never, ever be able to have paid users. No one's going to pay to use Facebook. They'll just go to some other free site. There's no, not going to be any Facebook premium. There's going to be nothing like that. There's not going to be a Facebook without ads for $2.99 a month. So like a lot of sites where you're not directly purchasing anything from, Facebook needs ad revenue to make itself money. And that primarily comes from the ads they show you on the side of your Facebook. People need to click on them. But 
here's why I think that is not making them as well, much money as Well, now they are say, talking Google. about their Facebook phone again. That's back in the news again in this past week just because I guess they're going to try to bump up their stock price a little bit. Right. Over and the past year, there's been the talk of the, the Facebook phone. And now in the past week, that talk's come around again. Right, and they've got enough money, and I'm sure they are just doing that to get the share price up. And they've got enough money that they'll probably buy a couple of products or, or something else and, and do okay. But it's an example of technology leapfrogging. And I'm going to use an analogy to the movie theater industry here that Ed will understand, but very few of you out there will realize based on basically being a movie theater nerd for probably more than half my adult life. But anyway, in the late 80s into the early 90s, this was just before stadium seating came out. So no theaters had stadium seating. Theater chains, your top notch quality theater chains that were building big, brand new, beautiful, boxy multiplexes, they were building these big theaters, spending a lot of money in, in good screen size, good sight lines, good auditorium size, and all that. And then stadium seating came out, and like that, it obsoleted everything that had come before. The conversion from a theater without stadium seating to a theater with stadium seating is incredibly expensive, and it's very cost prohibitive. A much smaller example in the same industry would be cup holders. For decades, nobody had cup holders. Then all of a sudden, theaters started being built with cup holders, and it was, you don't have a cup holder? Well, I can tell you right now, a cup holder installed probably only costs you about 15, 20 bucks a seat, but maybe you can get them for less. When you've got, you know, 2,000 seats, 3,000 seats, that adds up to a lot of money. So all of a sudden, you're sort of leapfrogging and obsoleting yourself so that a standard is set, and there's nothing else there that can match it except that it's standard. happening now with digital projection. Exactly. Everybody is being forced to go to digital projection at $100,000 per projector. Right, but the studios at least, or I should say the theater chains at least, fought that when it first came out. I remember digital projection, D2K with Sony going back to yes. 2001 or two. A couple of top grossing theaters in the country had a few of them, and the industry really did fight it because they realized that that technology turns over very, very quickly. And not only does it turn over very, very quickly, as Ed said, it's very, very expensive. You can't afford to keep doing it, whereas a theater could install a brand new 35 millimeter Christie projector, Christie platter, and Century JJ heads, and man, that thing, if you maintained it, could run for 40 years, could run indefinitely. So, anyway, Facebook was great when everyone was going on the internet and their computers, and people started getting wireless. But myself included, more and more, I access Facebook through my phone. And as smartphones grow and become the norm, I mean, they already have, but as they become more and more, the majority of people I think are going to be accessing Facebook through their phones. Yeah, and you're not so going to click on ads. They're not going to click on ads. Exactly. I know I had a very long, convoluted way of getting to that point. They're not going to be able to click on ads. How is Facebook going to do it? It's one of the most popular websites in the world, and they don't have a damn way to make money. If they're smart, they will do what Google is doing and start buying more valuable things, buying products, and really looking forward to the future when they're going to be something other than what it is. Google is a search engine, but it's so much more than a search engine. And I think that you know Google's moving into their Google Docs, for instance, and I think that's where they're going to have business platforms, and they've got their Google phone, and they, who does Google own? Motorola. Motorola. So, I mean, they're really looking into it. And seeing what they can do because – and I don't necessarily think they should buy – should have bought Motorola per se. But I'm going to give you a quote here. And this is a Sumner Redstone who owns National Amusements, Viacom, MTV, Paramount Pictures, CBS and all that. Content is king. Facebook shouldn't invest in any kind of hardware. They should be investing in their software. But the problem is they need to invest in things that are going to make the money. Google is doing that. Content, content, content is what Google is doing. They're buying content. They're Please, Facebook, buy out BaseNet. We'll give you all the content you want. We'll sell you a – we'll sell BaseNet for a very fair price. So anyway, it's got to be awful that, I mean, this guy was on top of the world and now it's say your stock isn't working anything. How the hell does your company make money? How frustrating must that be to have one of the most popular websites in the world and you can't make much money off it. Now, so I don't know if any of us are stock experts. Maybe Larry is. I don't want to speak for him. When do we buy Google, uh, Facebook stock no. if we do it all? You're not going to buy it now because it's still tanking. It hasn't bottomed out, I would assume. Do you hang around and hope that maybe it goes down to 10 or lower and then trying to buy it almost as a penny stock? Or if at the point that it almost gets to a penny stock, is this company, as my prediction is, just lends up? disappearing so you don't bother buying I've, it part, right and i think it, i think it's going to continue to plummet i mean i, oh, I, I can, i'm too. not enough of an expert to tell you where you should buy it i think long term facebook's going to be around it may rebound but they're facing an uphill battle from now and i don't think facebook itself is going to be what causes their rebound i think they're going to have to go like google and start going into different areas it's going to be tough for them because they're going to be moving away from what it is they do and what it is they uh they are and, and they 
really should try to maybe come out with a I don't know a browser or or a search engine or something I don't know. But Facebook is social media. I don't think it's going to. Well, I'm going to stick away. to my prediction before you move on to your next topic here or subject. Is Facebook's finished? Facebook will be gone in way less than the five years I initially projected, and okay. and that's how I see it. Because oh, wrong show. I'm sorry. If it's gone, Ed, you will have to. I will. If it's gone before five years, I'll buy you lunch at Great Chow and Quincy. If not, <laughs> you owe me lunch. If Facebook is still a big deal, and you got a deal. But anyway, we're going to move on. For our In the News section from around the world, President Obama is in a little bit of hot water with the polls. On the last couple of, sometime in the last couple of days of May, the president gave out the Presidential Medals of Freedom. And one of them was posthumously to a man who was instrumental in telling the West about what went on at the Nazi death camps in Poland. And there was a little slip of the tongue. Yeah, the president referred to them as the Polish death camps. And it's funny, the American media has not covered this, but every major website, news, TV station, and blog, and everything in Poland, they are all leading with this. It is all on their yeah, front they pages. are up in arms. They are absolutely livid that the president would say Polish death camps. As we all know from our history, there were Nazi death yeah, camps. Yeah, the Poles are the one that Poland. were persecuted. Exactly. And Poland took a beating from the Nazis, and then they took a beating for decades after that from the Russians. They were not happy to hear this. George W. Bush, under his tenure as president, led to one of, if not probably, the closest relationship between Poland and the United States, and I hope that that's not being distanced because of a slip-up that the president made. Now, people might say, well, it's just a slip-up, and, and of course the White House corrected it right away. Yeah, and in, in their but, defense, they did. They immediately you know, said that it was just a slip of the tongue, and he meant Nazi death camps. Right, and I'm sure he did, but you always do wonder. This is a man who constantly has a teleprompter on. You just you wonder because it's a slip-up. I don't know what the fallout's going to be. Mr. Obama's image around the world is obviously going to be tarnished. The polls, no matter what, are not going to be happy about this. Specifically, you know, it's not going to have too much of an election impact, I don't think. It probably won't have an election impact at all. But they're not happy on it. So that's a, you know, I want to encourage everyone out there, all of our listeners, always kind of check out what's going on around the world because sometimes there's news stories that are just all the rage somewhere else and they don't make the news media here. I think if this were to get broadcast here in a big deal, I think a lot of Jews in this country would be upset. I mean, you're talking about the Holocaust and you're talking about the president making a misstatement about it. It's one of those big deals you shouldn't make a misstatement about it. About it. Now, Larry, I know I don't think you're Polish. Being Jewish, do you have any specific way in on this or do you just a fluke in an accent like we all make i think that's probably all it was just a accidental accidental yeah again because as you said tony he reads a teleprompter he does he's a very good ad libber when he does ad lib but he reads a teleprompter 90 percent of the time and and of course he say, he turns the tide and says that Romney reads the teleprompter. Uh, you know, right? It's a, you know, and, and I, I I I think it was just a mistake. You know, again, you got the words. Uh, you know, you were thinking poll and you think death camp. I understand how it happens. Do I think he was legitimately trying to insult the polls or anything like that? No, of no, course not. no, I don't think so. Do I think that the White House is so ignorant as to not catch this mistake? They've made some other mistakes, particularly with the United Kingdom before. Uh, you know, do make you cringe a little bit, but I think it's a mistake. I think it could hurt the president a little bit, though, because it's not a nice mistake to make. Since we're talking about the president, and Eddie mentioned Mitt Romney, so we're going to move into our election update. Today's a big day. We, we were waiting for this day since whenever. Yep. Mitt Romney has clinched enough votes for the Republican nomination. Mitt Romney will be the Republican nominee for president of the United States in 2012. It is official. It is unchanging. So our primary season is over. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Viewpoint. Have a nice week. We'll see you in four years. Oh, yep. no. I'm sorry. We're not going anywhere. The primary season's over, but the general election is just <laughs> getting up. But that's all I want to mention on that. Uh, well, briefly, one one little electoral point here, and this is almost a, an editorial, but the president, as of late, has been trying to – I believe the term he's been using for Mr. Romney is corporate buyout specialist. And he's attempting to paint Mitt Romney as this big, evil, cigar-smoking executive who buys these companies and fires all the workers and steals all their assets, makes a huge profit out of it. And to an extent, that's a little bit what a buyout specialist does. I don't think he was a buyout specialist per se. He does have some very successful – Staples is a good example – chains to him. And I mean, in Romney's defense, I mean, in the president's defense, you got to hit your guy with something. If I was the president's advisor, I'd be telling them, let's, you know, attack Mitt Romney on this or that. I think this is ultimately a bad strategy for the president, however. And I'm going to tell you why. 
Mitt Romney isn't your typical corporate executive. He's no Donald Trump. He's certainly no Newt Gingrich, not that Newt Gingrich is a, uh, a corporate executive. But Mitt Romney, first of all, is not a cigar chomping executive. As we all know, he doesn't smoke. He doesn't even drink. He doesn't even drink caffeine. So, I mean, he is a very goody two-shoe. He's been married to the same woman for 40-some-odd years. He had five children with this woman, with this woman, Ann Romney. He's got, I think, 17 or 19 grandchildren. I always forget every time I read an article. I think it changes. His wife did suffer through breast cancer. She survived. She does currently suffer with uh, MS, multiple sclerosis. And all throughout this, Mitt Romney has been by her side and with her and is just a happily married man. You don't have that with John Edwards, who's in the news lately, who's just a disgusting jerk. I don't even want to get into it. Newt Gingrich on his 14th marriage because he's a piece of crap. I mean, Rush Limbaugh, for those of you who are a fan out there, is on like his fourth marriage. Donald Trump, you might say, is that he's, I don't know how many yeah, marriages he's got a few as well, right. So this trying to paint him as this big evil corporate executive type, I think is going to backfire on the president. And I'm not saying that because I want it to backfire on the president, which I do. I just think you've got to be careful. He's not your typical big evil corporate executive. I mean, he's not having the big parties in Vegas and, you know, the strippers in New York and all that or, or whatever the CEOs do with their millions. He's made a lot of money, but he's, he's a goody two-shoe. He's, he's a choir boy. He, he's a church boy. You know, he's the good Mormon. He gives a couple million dollars to his church every year. So, I mean, you really, really got to look at it and say, are you going to be able to paint him like this? I think that's going to backfire because nobody's going to see this big evil, you know, Sumner Redstone – ditched his wife and took a woman half his age and you know, screwed his wife out of the company and screwed one of his kids out of money. I mean, Mitt Romney's done nothing like that. I think all of his money for a while now is tied up in a big trust. So anyway, without getting, you know, spending too much time on this, the president is going to try to paint him as this big evil corporate guy. And I don't think that's going to work because Mitt Romney's not really that. And I think what he did at Bain, he can explain. He's not the head of Goldman Sachs where you sit there for half an hour and listen to him and still don't know what they really do. Mitt Romney can explain what he did and it makes sense to people. And he's got a wife and he's got five children and 49 grandchildren and all that. So I think that's going to fail. We're going to move on to a election update in Massachusetts where we're going to talk about Elizabeth Warren, Democratic candidate for Senate against U.S. Senator Scott Brown, Republican. And Larry, I'm going to turn it over here to you to talk about Elizabeth Warren and her Cherokee heritage. The big thing is when are these politicians who are running for elected office going to learn that it's better to stop ducking these questions? It's better if they just answer the question and come clean. This John Zaremba from the Herald wanted to interview her and either Dizzy Lizzy or one of her aides said, we're running late. We got to go, and she just jumped into the car, closed the door, and they took off. Didn't Why is even there a controversy the over this heritage? Oh. Or what's the controversy? She claims that uh, she has Cherokee heritage. She's provided no documentation to prove it. Now, I think that's a controversy for two reasons. One, and I understand that the, the uh, Native tribes do consider people, if they're up to 116th or 132nd, uh, to be a member of the tribe, etc., but... I think a little bit of gall on her part, before we even get to the fact that she apparently isn't, a little bit of gall on her part to try to present herself as a minority because she's what, – what does she claim? She's 116th or 132nd Cherokee? I think it's 132nd. I'm okay. Not sure. So I, I, I'm willing to go on a boat here. Now, I grew up in a very diverse area. Something tells me that being 132nd Cherokee – has not subscribed you to the same type of discrimination and lesser opportunities that, say, being, I don't know, black has been? I could be wrong here, but something tells me that somebody doesn't look at this woman and say, oh, my God, let's not sell this house to that 132nd Cherokee yeah, woman absolutely. over there. Now, what Larry's talking about is how she's really been ducking and dodging this issue because I believe it was Howie Carr. A lot of research, for those of you not familiar with the uh, Masters and Center race, has come out that – she, while at Harvard, uh, when she applied to be a professor at Harvard, had listed herself as a minority. And, and, you know, there's some debate there whether or not she claimed minority status. She was listed in some Harvard brochures and whatnot as a, you know, minority professor. And I, what really bothers me about it, whether or not it's even true or not, is the fact that she would feel comfortable being termed a minority professor when she's 132nd Cherokee. I mean, that is just awful. Awful, 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 awful. Larry, any no. comments? No, just doesn't sound right. This is just as bad as John Kerry with his sailboat, Isabel. 
He refuses to keep it here in Massachusetts. Well, he did have it in Nantucket for a while, but now it's back in Rhode Island. Right, and he does that, for those of you who don't know, to dodge taxes. Right. Why doesn't he just keep it here in Massachusetts and pay the excise tax on it? Because he doesn't want to, because he knows how awful and high the taxes are in Massachusetts. You bring up a great point about you know the consistency and the quality of politicians, particularly in Massachusetts, because this has happened before. Scott Brown, listen, I can tell you, the night Scott Brown, and I'm not a big Scott Brown fan. I like what Scott Brown represents because he's not Martha Coakley. He's not Elizabeth Warren. Eh, him in and of self, I like him. He's a good guy. I'm uh, ecstatic about him or anything. But I remember the night he got elected. He got elected. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who was in Japan at the time serving in the Marines, and we just couldn't believe – that a Republican had gotten elected to the Senate in Massachusetts. It was unheard of. But in Teddy Kennedy's seat. In Teddy Kennedy's seat of all seats. But Martha Coakley, his opponent then, ran afoul of the same problems that Elizabeth Warren is now. They are really, really out of touch. Now, I'm not saying Scott Brown is in touch, but, I mean, they just they, – they think they're going to walk right into the seats. They've lived these lives their whole life in Massachusetts where nobody's ever questioned yeah, them. Yeah, Coakley was some 30 points in the lead. Yeah, and, and all of a sudden, and listen, Scott Brown was a second-rate state senator in Massachusetts. I mean, he, he really rose to national prominence based on his ability, you know, the fact that everyone just didn't want a, a poor quality candidate like Martha Coakley, who's done a pretty good job as attorney general, but she just assumed that she was the presumptive nominee for the Democrats and would automatically win and that there would be a token Republican challenger. And I think Elizabeth Warren, who's a very left-wing liberal, she's definitely a progressive just assumed that, oh, well, Martha made some mistakes. There was that Tea Party thing. I'm going to come in and do the same thing. And now she's quaking in her boots. And I think her campaign is struggling because I've seen less and less from them over the last few weeks since this came out. And I think that they're waiting and they're probably going to try to lay low until maybe sometime in June or July, late June, I should say, early July, or maybe a little bit later to then restart the campaign in a sense because they want this controversy to go away because it is enough to sink her. I mean, at a bottom line, are you going to vote for a woman who lied about her heritage, who used this as an advantage when there was no damn reason to. You're one thirty-second Cherokee. I mean, come on. I can't figure that no, at all. No way would I vote for anybody who lied on their resume or said I'm part Cherokee when I'm really not. Yeah, I think this is really, really going to have an impact on it. This could be the issue that brings her down. I'm willing to say go on a bet, and I think it, it very well might. She's going to lay low because she doesn't want people to know about this. And I almost feel bad that all these idiots out there who believe in her, you put your time and your effort and you're still going to expect a campaign for this woman who lied to you, who used her false minority status. Well, you know what? It's still going to come down to riding coattails as well, though. If President Obama lands up winning almost in a landslide, she's going to get in. If Romney lands up winning, Scott Brown will get in. Yeah, I, uh, I coattails is going to have a lot to do with it. Right. I, if it's the way it is now, it's hit or miss. If it's, you know, 43, 42 or whatever. I mean, if Romney's ahead 60 to 40, yeah, people are going to go with Scott Brown. Um, and it depends on to what extent they campaign together and all that. One brief interesting interlude before we move on to uh, close out the episode here with a couple of things. A lot of her donations have come from out of state. Now, a lot of Scott Brown's donations have come from out of state as well. So party lines aside, I want to get what your opinions are on a Senate race in funding from outside the state. Because remember, no matter what, the Senate is voting on issues important to the whole nation. But should a man in California be able to give a million dollars to Elizabeth Warren or Scott Brown? I don't think so. No. I agree with you. You know, we're talking about U.S. senators, not state senators. But still, there a U.S. Right. senator from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Let those, you know, you're just through the state of California out there, so let's use that. Let these uh, residents of California worry about their own U.S. senators. I, I agree 100%. And I was disappointed, I should say, that both Elizabeth Warren and Scott Brown had a significant portion of their money come from out of state. And I mean, for me, as a resident of Massachusetts... I don't like that. I don't like the idea that somebody from the outside is influencing an election that might have an impact right. on my state. This is somebody who's going to be advocating for me. I don't want who they want. I want who's best for me for Massachusetts. I think it would be nice if the two of them or two candidates somewhere, they won't do it now, would stand up and say, hey, we're not taking money from my Don't accept state. the money. Sure. Exactly. I mean they'll never do it because it's millions upon millions of dollars. And that was one of the reasons Scott Brown got elected in the first place. I supported him the first time and I do now. But I think that's – it's still a little bit disappointing. That is what we had for our uh, election update. 
All right, folks, as we move to close out our episode, we're going to go on to our On the Lighter Side section. And I want to have a brief discussion, and I'd really like it if our Viewpoint listeners out there could email us and let us know. I've always wondered why Chinese food in this country is different regionally. I've never quite understood it. The Boston region in particular has a very specific type of Chinese food. And it's not the same that you get in upstate New York or in Vermont or in D.C. or Florida or, or California. And people I know from this area, when they move out of this area and they come back to the Boston area, they've got to have Chinese food because they can't get it like you get it in Boston and the surrounding area anywhere else. And I've never understood why. I was in D.C. a couple of years ago and I said, ooh, I'm going to have some Chinese food. I want to try it down here. And it was just awful. I had it in Florida a couple of years ago. It was awful. I tried it once in California. Forget about it. All they have is that mall style crap out there. In Vermont a few weeks ago, I had Chinese food, and the lobster sauce was clear. Lobster sauce is supposed to be brown, isn't it, lobster? That's right. Exactly. So I just don't understand why it's different regionally. Somebody please explain that to me. I've always been a big fan of Chinese food. For whatever reason, the town I grew up in always had rotating about five different Chinese restaurants in a town of about 35, 36,000 people. So I was always exposed to quite a bit of different Chinese food, and I would always, of course, rate and rank which ones were good, which ones were bad which ones are on the up. I, at one point in time, had plans with a friend of mine to uh, drive across Massachusetts and eat at every Chinese restaurant in the state and rank them all. I Thank God I didn't do that. I'd probably be dead from the MSG. But folks out there in uh, Viewpoint Land and in, on Basin Land, email us in. Let us know what you think about the Chinese food in your area. And if you're from the Boston area, let us know what you like. If you're outside the Boston area, let us know if you've had our Chinese food and why it's so much better than it is anywhere else in the country. But that being said, as we wrap up this episode, I want to thank everyone for listening, and I want to remind you, you can always visit us at BaseNetTV.com, BaseNetTV.com. We are also on YouTube and Mevio. We're on Twitter. We're on the Twitter. We're on the Facebook. We're on the Google+. Plus. We're also able to be reached at Viewpoint at BaseNetTV.com, Viewpoint at BaseNetTV.com, Viewpoint at BaseNetTV.com. Shoot us your emails with your concerns, your complaints, your comments, whatever it is you want to send us, send us to us about the Chinese food, about the episodes. And we aren't want. going anywhere for four years. I was just kidding. Yeah, no, we're definitely not going anywhere for four, four years, except straight to the top. If you also could remember, we always do take donations at BaseNet. So as always, please visit us at BaseNetTV.com. Comment, email us, click on our ads, donate, do whatever it is you can do. And we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you next week with episode 16. This is Tony Mizuko signing off. <laughs>